Good morning, everybody. My name is Matt Kistler. I'm one of the elders here. Welcome on this beautiful day to Cornerstone Christian Fellowship. In case you're wondering, I just want to put this out from the beginning. The tent over here is not one of Kurt Tracy's ideas that we're going to have church in the tent. We're, we're, we're okay. We're safe. Yeah, yeah. That, that is not the new altar place where you go inside the tent. No. All of these awesome decorations and more all around are for our VBS this week. We are excited. It is going to be monumental. Um, so we're excited for our VBS this week. And yeah, just so you know, we, we, we weren't going for like a Southwest decor just for fun. There is a reason. Let's all stand for a call to worship. Today, during our prayer time uh, before the service, which, just so you know, anyone is welcome to join. We meet as elders, not because there's like, you have to have your elders pass card to join the prayer. It's because it is so rich each week. It is something that we love to do. So if you see us there and it feels awkward and you're like, am I allowed to join? You are welcome to join and pray with us. Just putting that out there. But today we were thinking about this image of waves crashing at the ocean. And one of the words that came out was that when you're at the break, breaker line, the waves can look enormous and they just crash over you over and over again. It can feel like you're going to go under. But if you just move ahead, if you can get through that, there's peace on the other side. And that doesn't even change the waves. The same waves are rolling through you, rolling past you. And so we're exploring, what is Christ asking us? What is Christ telling us about life here? And we're going to hear, I mean, it really just links up with what Sandra's sharing today about Christ and Peter and reconciliation and the invitation Christ has for us to continue to experience the challenges we face and move through them, accept that they're there and know that God is walking with us, inviting us to the peace on the other side. So let's pray. God, we pray that as we confront waves, breaks in our life that can feel overwhelming, that we can find the vision, that we can hear your voice of invitation, not of shame, not of condemnation, but invitation to move through and find your peace. Lord, we thank you that you are with us, navigating life together, individually and as a community. Lord, we worship you, we praise you. In all these things, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
everyday things, how you breathe with us. Thank you, God, for how you walk with us, how you speak to us, how you whisper our name. Thank you, God, for the dreams that you share with us, for the vision you give us. Thank you for just living with us, being with us, loving on us every day, all the days. You're always there. You see us. You move with us. Thank you, Jesus. Just want to give you glory today, God.
You were singing over me sweet songs, Jesus. Cause you've been so, so good to me. And before I took a breath,
Lord, we are thankful for your love. You're th we're thankful for your pursuit of us. We're never too far gone. And we're never too close that we can't find more of you. We rejoice, we celebrate that we can meet you in spaces like this and recognize that you're here, you're real, and that your love for us fills us with purpose, with identity, with, with hope. Thank you. I'd like to call forward our ushers. If you believe in what we're doing here, if you believe in what God is doing here, we invite you to join with us. We appreciate all those who give to make these moments together possible, where we can celebrate, where we can recognize and foster this moment of worship that isn't everything, but it's something so tangible and real, real when we're together. God, we pray your blessing over all the people here as they decide to give. We thank you for allowing us to have this space together, this building, comfortable place to sit, music to enjoy, people to guide and shepherd us. Lord, you've provided all these things and we look to you to continue providing and we may meet with you here again for years to come. Amen. I want to invite all the children going to Kingdom Kids. And we'll just pray for them as they go. They can go back to where Miss Rashid is. Lord, thank you for our children. Thank you for how you reveal yourself through them. We pray that they would be able to grasp how wide and high and deep and great your love is for us. Amen. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for. The main event. The one and only. The indomitable. Miss Sandra. Come on up here. They like to hype you up, don't they? Good morning. As he said, I am the indomitable Sandra Anderson, <laughs> Reverend. See, sometimes I still think I'm an intern, so. <laughs> Anybody like Disney movies? Yes. Besides Britney and Sharon, they don't count that. <laughs> they don't count, they don't count. What's your favorite Disney movie? You just yell it out. Blue Mermaid, Aladdin. I see y'all, y'all love Disney, don't you? <laughs> well, my favorite Disney movie is The Lion King, because I ain't heard none of that. Anybody like The Lion King? All right, all right. I mean, the movie just starts off so beautiful, like some great scene. Anybody remember how it started off? I was going to ask y'all to do it, but y'all just did it automatically. <laughs> Let me hear it one more time. Oh, All right. Yeah. <laughs> hey, somebody been watching The Lion King. Don't you love it, Yeah. See, I was a little worried. 
And then I saw Britney Tuesday, and guess what she had on? The Lion King shirt. I told you she's a Disney fanatic. And it said Akuna Matala. And I said, you know what? I ain't got no words about this sermon. Cause it's Destin. It was Destin. So I appreciate that. Y'all just, you know what? Just like the movie started off with that, and it meant it was going to be a good movie. Like, after that song, I was like, the end. Like, great. Hopefully, this sermon go just like that, all right? Like I said, everything was going great in the movie, you know, we singing and dancing, you know, having a good time until there's one particular scene that just changed the whole trajectory of the movie. Remember the scene where, you know, Scar like pushes Mufasa off the cliff? Like it was the worst scene ever. Like for me, this movie came out when I was eight years old. So like it was the first time that I ever thought of like, man, my parents can die. Like, I went from singing and dancing in this movie to, like, what just happened? Like, Simba's running around, and he's like, help somebody, anybody. And I'm like, wow, that is so depressing. Like, it was just all downhill from there. And then Squire rolls up on him, and he's like, man, like, look what you did. And he's like, man, it was an accident. He's like, what would your mother say? Like, he's, like, filling Simba with all this, you know, condemnation and shame. And Simba's like, you know, like, what should I do? He's like, run. Run away and never return. So that's what Simba does. He runs away, and he finds himself, like, in this desert. Like, I thought Simba was dead. Like, he, he ran so far. Like, he ran till he couldn't run no more. And that's when we find, you know, Timon and Pumbaa. And they come up on him and they're like, you know, they teach him about this new place and he's eating new things, you know, becoming a new person. And they introduce him to Akuna Matata and they tell him, you know, it means don't worry. So Simba didn't have no worries in this new place. So he grows up and we're like, okay, he's living a good little life. Years later we see, you know, Nala comes back on the scene and she's like, hey, man, you need to come back. You know, I'm glad you're alive. You know, you need to come back and be king. Like, that's your spot. And he's like, no, like, you don't know what I did. Like, I can't, I can't go back there. So she's not convincing him at all to, like, come back. He's like, no, you know, I can't tell you the story, but I can't go back there. Like, I got a lot of past. So then we see Rafiki again. And he comes, and he's like being annoying. He's like all in Simba's face. And Simba's like, man, who is you? And he's like, no. The question is, who are you? So Simba's like, you know what? Like, I used to know, but I don't know no more. And he's like, I know who you are. You Mufasa's boy. And he's like, you know my father? And he's like, well, he said, you knew my father. And he's like, no, I know your father. So Simba's like, well, I hate to tell you, but like he died. And he's like, no, he's alive. I'll show you. I'll take him to you. So at this point, you know, Simba's all excited. I'm excited. I'm like, man, has he been living another life all this time? And I thought he was dead. <laughs> so like we running through the woods, you know, Simba gets flashed by, you know, branches and stuff. And he comes and like Rafiki's like, stop, you know, look down here. And I'm like, okay, Mufasa's about to be down here. He like shows him this like river and he's like looking at his reflection. He's like, man, that ain't my dad. That's just my reflection. And Rafiki is like, no, look hard. And he's like, we see this transformation and Mufasa comes out of the sky and he's like, Simba, you have forgotten me. And Simba's like, no, nah, man, how can I forget you? And he's like, You've forgotten who you are, so you have forgotten me. So then he tells them that you must look inside yourself, Simba. You are more than what you have become. You must take your place in this great circle of life. And Simba's like, how can I go back? I'm not who I used to be. And Mufasa just says, remember who you are. You are my son, the one true king. Remember who you are. And then Simba, you know, is just crying and stuff like, no, don't leave me, don't leave me. Now that we spun up on the Lion King, 
today, you know, I want you to keep that imagery in your head as we journey to the book of John, chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon P Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The, ter the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you would stretch out your hands and someone else would dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. The reading of the word. First things first. Who is Peter? Anybody know who Peter is? One who denied Christ not once, not twice, but three times. Disciple. All right, all right. You know a little bit. So notice in verse 15, Jesus is not referring to Peter as Peter. He says, Simon, son of John. At first when I got this text, you know, I read past this. I was like, you know, that ain't nothing important. Because honestly, when I get my text, you know, I, I read through it. And then, you know, about 10 times out of 10, I close my book or I throw my phone and say, you know what? That lady really don't like me. <laughs> that lady is the Reverend Dr. <laughs> Tracy. I'm like, you know, I, I went through the internship. I feel like at this point by now, I deserve an easy text. Like, I, I, I just don't get it. So through my phone, through my Bible, I said, ain't nothing in this text making sense to me. <laughs> Felt like the disciple, you know, stuff was just going over my head. I'm like, yeah, I ain't got nothing for you. So, you know, I had to pray fervently, came back to the text, and I'm like, okay, God, we're going to try this again. So I opened up my Bible, and Simon's son of John just popped out to me. And I'm like, you know, like, what, what is this? So then I realized that Jesus, in his mysterious way, is pointing out, a, trying to prove a point. You ever notice how your name changed based on, you know, with people based on situations? I know as, as a kid, you understand. Like for me, in my family, I go by Monique. But sometimes, you know, my dad would call me, he'd be like, Sandra Anderson. Like first and last name, no Monique, nowhere to be found. And that's how I know that some ain't right in this relationship. But this is about to be a serious <laughs> conversation. Or I do it, like the billion, I'd be like, I call him Billy Bob sometime. If he in trouble, I'm like, billion. Or I'd be like, hey boy. You know, like, <laughs> it ain't, you know, hey, sweetheart, you know, hey, Billy Bob, we ain't playing. Like, you know that something is different, you know, just like with your significant others, you know. Sometimes you notice how you go from bae or sweetheart to your first name. <laughs> and Tony, what would you call her? You'd be like, the reverend? Are you, you said, <laughs> you said call her <laughs> Doctor. Um. <laughs> You know something wrong when people start calling you by a name prior to what they now calling you. And that's how I felt like in this moment. Jesus is like, you know, Simon, son of John. He's not calling him by Peter. And, and I can be petty too. I do the same thing. I, I, I do it. Sometimes I like being petty. True fact. <laughs> now we go back to John 1 verses 42. I know y'all remember this, you know, Pastor Tracy preached this in 1994 when The Lion King came out. <laughs> now, for real, it was March 2021. 20, I mean, 94, 21, almost the same. <laughs> Still a long time ago. 
That's how long we've been in the book of John. <laughs> Andrew, Peter's brother, brings him to Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and he says, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which was translated as Peter. And our boy John, in his detailed fashion, is the only gospel that records this name change. Why is this important? Because Jesus looks at Peter and he tells him his past and his future all in the same breath. He didn't just change his name to some random name just to be calling him some short name or whatever. The Hebrew meaning for Cephas or Peter is rock. And Jesus in this moment gave him a purpose. See, Simon, son of John, was just a fisherman. But Peter is a fisher of men is who he called him to be. So there's, there's one person, but Simon, son of John, all he knows is being a fisherman. And when Jesus called him to be Peter, he gave him a purpose to be Peter, the rock, and to fish men. So he changed his occupation, changed his destiny. So Jesus takes Peter back to the beginning, no longer referencing him as Peter, which he called him. And if you remember last week, in the text, Peter went back to doing what he was doing before he met Jesus. And honestly, you know, he wasn't doing a good job. You know, he was still just catching seaweed. You know, he wasn't really catching no fish. So going back wasn't really a good thing. Like, he didn't waste no time. And until now, I didn't even understand that denial was more than just saying, like, I don't know you. You know, I used to take this text light and just be like, oh, Jesus... You know, he was in fear, and he was just like, man, I don't know him, like, just to try to get out of trouble, when really the word deny in Greek means to refuse to acknowledge someone's identity or even their existence. How can Peter be a disciple when he refused to acknowledge Jesus' identity or his existence? Deny means to renounce and to formally declare one's abandonment to give up and resign by formal declaration. So Peter wasn't just saying, oh, I don't know him. Peter was saying, I formally declare my abandonment. I do not acknowledge his existence or his identity as Jesus or the Messiah, and don't associate me with this man. Like Peter got so mad that in Matthew and Mark, they say that he began cursing and swearing with an oath. Like, Peter was mad, man. I was reading this text like, calm down now, Peter. Like, <laughs> Peter was upset. Like, I don't know this man. Like, quit telling me that I know this man. So Peter, you know, the phrase when it says, you know, like, you're cursing and doing this earth, this oath. You ever heard the phrase of, if I'm lying, may God strike me down? You know, that, that used to hold something until Peter, you know, when, when Peter started saying it, like, he knew he was lying, so, you know, like now when people tell me, you know, on oh, my mama, you know, on oh, my life, I ain't lying. Or, it, you know, if God, you know, if I'm lying, may God strike me down. I just kind of take a step left because <laughs> I know they like Peter, like they just lying. They just saying this because they mad, but they really, you know, kind of lying. So Peter fell, and just like Simba, he finds himself in a place where the person he loved is now dead. And although it wasn't his fault, he had a part to play in it. So for three days, imagine Peter and how he may have felt. He looked at Jesus and realized what he did on that third denial, and he wept. Can you imagine that image in your head for three days, knowing that you was the one who was proudly professing, like, even if everyone else deserts you, I'll never desert you, and knowing that you did it three times, and on the third time, you actually look in this man in his face. Imagine holding that image for three days. And I can imagine an enemy, you know, Peter feeling guilt and shame, condemnation, and maybe even hearing the voice of saying, what would Mary think? What would the disciples think if they know that you did this? Just like Simba, it's like, Man, what is everybody going to think when they know that I did, I did deny Christ? How can I go professing the word now knowing that I just said I don't even know this man? 
So what can he do besides run? Now in Matthew 16, Jesus was asking the disciples, who do people say I am? And then he asked the disciples, you know, who do you say I am? And Peter answered him and said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus tells him, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you, Peter, that you are Peter, which means rocks, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell would not conquer it, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Yet again, we see him reference him as Simon, son of John, and the proclamation of Peter who holds the keys to the kingdom. They're two different people. And like he continues to purposely let us know that he's not talking to Simon, son of John. Simon doesn't hold the same aspect as Peter. And he told Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. So he didn't call Simon, the fisherman, to do this task. He called that to Peter. But when Peter denied him, Peter went back to being something that God hadn't called him to be. So God can't fulfill that promise in his life by him going back to being something that he no longer called him to. It's like that scene in The Lion King where Mufasa brings Simba and he shows them all the land and he's like, everything the light touches is yours. Jesus did the same thing for Peter and told him like, you hold the key to the kingdom. Everything is yours. But just like Simba ran away and all that was his was no longer his anymore because he chose to run, Peter did the same thing. And everything that he had access to, he lost. Not because Jesus took it away from him, but because he chose to run. When someone gives you the key to something that they own, that's usually a big deal. You don't give any and everybody a key to your house, a key to your car, a key to your heart or your valuable assets. But Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you the key to my whole kingdom. Does anybody you know, have exes or something that still have access to your house? Access to your keys? People that you don't talk to still have access to call you? So when Peter denounced him, it's like, why would, why would he still feel he's entitled to have access to this when you denounce me? So Jesus is like, I'm going to fix that for you because I still want this for you. So Jesus, just like we talked about in this reckless love, he's not holding it against Peter. He comes to Peter and he's like, I got to fix this for you. And Mark gets the kudos points for this because he's the only one that records this in his gospel. Mark says, you are looking for Jesus, but he is risen. Go tell the disciples and Peter. And I love this because a little bit of it was pity, you know. I'm pity, but this little bit, I was like, that's a little pity to be like the disciples and Peter. But it was also profound that Jesus is saying, Although you may say, like, you're not a disciple anymore, I'm still going to call you by name. You're still invited. I want you to know that I've risen too because I still got a purpose for you. And he spent this time to restore Peter. So after they, he found him you know, fishing or whatever. He called him back to have this conversation with him, asking him, do you love me? And he does this three times, just as many times as he denies him in order to restore him. He didn't hold a shame or condemnation over him. He just says, hey, do you love me? And like Peter says, you know I love you. And Jesus invites him into, you know, not only just being a fisherman, he invites him to being a shepherd. He invites him to more. He, he never has the conversation of, or you remember what you did, or you remember you said you don't know me. He just brings his love and his acceptance, and he says, do you love me? Now, here's the task that I have for you. 
and he gives them that chance to reconcile that relationship. Who or what have you let run you away from your rightful place in the kingdom? Who have you let fill you with shame and guilt and condemnation? Have you forgotten the Father because you've forgotten yourself? You've forgotten who you are? 2,023 years later, the gates of hell still has not prevailed the church because Peter was that rock. Prophecy was fulfilled. And I think about the people that I know even here in this church who've told their stories of, well, I used to be able to work with the kids and someone ran me off. And Jesus is saying, do you love me? Teach my children. I think of people who said, I used to paint and I lost that passion. And Jesus is saying, do you love me? Paint the painting. Or people who used to play drums and people run you off and Jesus says, do you love me? Play the drums. Sing the song. Be who you are. Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but through him, the world may be saved. Jesus does not bring shame and condemnation, so whatever or whoever made you run, it's probably a scar in this situation. Somebody that's just pushing you away because they know that you are entitled to something and that you are great, and they're pushing you away to be something that you're not. I think of back in 2019 after I first visit here and I was in that same place of feeling like, you know, people ran me away, people ran me away from the church, people ran me away from my family and it's like, I vividly heard Jesus say to me, it's like, you, you got a good life as a soldier. And it's like, you're doing good, you got your own life, but I have something better for you. But will you trust me to the more? Because just like Simba, it's like, I have a good life, I'm doing good, but I wasn't doing what I was called to be. I forgot who God had called me to be. And I was just living life. Because like Simba, you know, like, real talk, where he was kind of looked better than Pride Rock, even Timon and Puma, like, we finna fight for this? <laughs> so it don't mean that your life is bad, but... Are you living your life to the fullness of who you're called to be? Are you going by Simon, son of John, when God has called you to be a Peter? Because just like that, had Peter continued to be a fisherman, we wouldn't have the church now 2,023 years later. If he would have continued to run from who God had called him to be. Your life is important. What you do is important. It impacts everyone. Just like this image of the circle of life, everyone has their own place in this circle of life. And what, what and who you are matters. Because had I just stayed in that place, I wouldn't be standing before you now, four years later, an elder and an ordained minister. Because people told me no, I ran from it. But just like Peter, God restored that relationship and he called me and I answered and said, yes, I love you. Yes, I will feed your sheep. So what is God calling you to? Will you return and claim your rightful place and receive your keys to the kingdom? Because everything the light touches is yours. But don't go to that shadowy place. You must never go there. <laughs> God has not left us. Anytime you think that he is, you look in a mirror, and just like Rafiki said, he lives in you because he left the gift of the Holy Spirit to always live with us. So never feel like you're, you're alone. Find your place in this great circle of life and remember 
who you are. Amen. You know, there's a part of me, what's stirring in me right now is, where have I run? What area of my life have I run from God? And what is God inviting me into? So can we pause for a moment here? And just close our eyes. You know, we're all human. And I think that all of us have these areas where we say, God, you can have this, 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 and this, but this I'm keeping. Or sometimes we're too afraid to, to look into that mirror and see who God really invites us to be. So I want us to pause and ask God, where am I running? How am I hiding? What is your invitation for me? And I'm going to go quiet for about a minute. And let's listen. You know, God is always inviting us into the more. God is always whispering our name and calling us. And there will forever and always be the scars. Those that are our naysayers, those that tell us to run, those that tell us we can't. But God sees our true selves. Lord, we say yes to you. Yes to your invitation. Yes to the more. I think of the image that Matt brought in our call to worship breaking through that breaker, breaking through the place where the waves break that seem so tumultuous to get to the other side, to move through it. stirring in my head as we say yes Lord do you have that in your head by any chance do you want me to sing it <laughs> let me find it Can we 
stand and sing this. That's not it. We say, let's try it this way. And we say, yes, God, we accept the invitation to You've had an experience in your life where you've run and you returned and you were met with open arms. Just look around the room. God is so faithful. God is so good. You can keep standing because I'm just going to give a couple of announcements and then we're going to close with the benediction. Food pantry is open today, so please... Go into the back, grab food, grab for your neighbors, whatever you need is back. Well, not whatever you need. It's not like a grocery store, but <laughs> grab some food on your way out. And uh, if you're visiting us, we want to welcome you. Thank you for visiting us. Please fill out the visitor card that would uh, so we can stalk you. Just kidding. Um, please fill out the visitor card. We just want to send you some information, let you know a little bit more about Cornerstone. And you can put it in the box in the back. And VBS starts tonight. Woohoo! Yay! Can I just say thank you to, I know that Rashida and Natalia aren't in this room right now, but thank you to everybody who, this could not happen without people saying yes and without this community volunteering. So, Gird up. Please pray for those who are serving and uh, 
It's such a big thing and so much fun. And listen, if you want to come watch, come watch, 6 to 8. So it's just a real sweet time. And finally, you know, as Matt said, I'm always thinking different ideas as we come together. And one of the things that I realize, and I'm sure everybody heard it this morning, is we love to talk. We love to be together. We love to talk. And so we are starting, we believe in failing fast here. And what that means is Pastor T gets ideas and I bring it to the elders and they look at me and they smile and they go, okay, we can try. So we are now starting um, the last Sunday of every month is we are going to have our community connect and chat day. Is that what it's called? Yes, it is. I got it right. Woohoo! So, it's community, connect, and chat. And what we're going to do is we're going to break into small groups, about groups of five, and we're going to hang and we're going to talk and we're going to fellowship around God's word and we're going to look at each other in the eye because we all love to commune. And then next week, also, the kids are going to lead us in a couple of songs after VBS. So it's gonna be a fun day. And, and, where's Shar? Shar, where are you? Are you here? Are you here? Okay, she with the kids? Okay. Shar is making her cinnamon buns. All right. So, community connect and chat and eat cinnamon. Or kinnamon, so that it goes with the C. Yeah, consume. Yes, there you go, Chloe. <laughs> All right. Let's, benediction. Yes, Lord, we thank you so much for this community. We thank you for your love in the midst of it all. We thank you that you are forever calling us back to our true selves and that you see us. You see us before. You see what our potential is. And you see where we are and you love us in all three spaces, and you invite us always into the deeper, to break through the waves, to get to their sweet spot with you. So Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for worship and the word and your life in the midst. Pray over VBS this week. Let your presence be known from one moment to the next. I pray for strength for every leader, every volunteer that is a part of that. And we thank you, Lord. And I pray all God's blessings as we go out into this world. And I pray we share Christ with our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Hold on. Hold on. Hi, everyone. Um, we need help putting the chairs up for VBS. Um, so where Sandra's standing, all those chairs on the left-hand side, my right-hand side, are all going to be stacked up against the wall. And then only the first two rows here are going to be put away, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can clap. That's good.